Okay, so I guess we should go ahead and get started. So good afternoon, everyone. Thank you all so much for coming out at almost the end of the semester, walking all the way down here to the Mershon Center. I know I tricked some of my students into doing that, so welcome. Um, and uh, my name is Joe Parrott. I'm assistant professor with the history department. Uh, and it's really my great uh, honor to, um, to have invited, to have, to introduce uh, Stephen Massacura here. Um, even though I'm actually moving right now, literally in the midst of what we're talking about, I'm moving, which is why I'm dressed like this, because I actually packed my blazer and my nice <laughs> shoes, but my socks and my tie match, so that's what's important, right? Um, but it's, it's a, an honor to have Steven here. We actually go way back, my first graduate class ever. Um, in history, I was actually in, in class with Stephen, and I remember being intimidated even then by what he was doing and what he was bringing. Uh, and so it's wonderful to have him here, and he's going to be uh, presenting a lecture called Dethroning the Goddess of GNP, Environmentalist, International Development, and the Origins of Ecological Economics. And Stephen is a scholar of U.S. and international history. He focuses on political economy, international development, U.S. foreign relations, and environmentalism. And you're currently an assistant professor, right? Mm -hmm. An assistant professor at the School of Global and International Studies at IU Bloomington. And he's the author of, of Limits and Growth, The Rise of Global Sustainable Development in the 20th Century, which came out from Cambridge in 2015, wow, which is longer ago than I realized. Uh, the book analyzes how environmental NGOs struggle to implement environmental protection measures in the developing world in the 1950s and the 1960s, and then critiqued and reformed the development policies of the U.S. government, the World Bank, uh, the U.N. system uh, into the 70s and 80s. And I actually really appreciate this book because it's not just about NGOs, it's actually about this kind of intersection of NGOs and decolonization and this real decentralization of the international system. And as someone who studies decolonization, as someone who studies uh, Africa in particular, uh, I really appreciate that you're kind of bringing this into the conversation and you're making people kind of confront what a, a big global change this was, not just this kind of localized thing um, that's yeah. happening in Africa. So I really do appreciate that work. And I highly recommend for any of you who haven't read the book to, to go out and pick it up because it's a really fascinating study. Um, but currently, uh, Stephen is undertaking a new project that's kind of building off of the one that he published the book on um, and explores these various critiques of economic growth since uh, the 1960s by revealing how reformers have challenged and sought to rethink the ways in which the concept of growth, quote unquote, has, has been defined, assessed, and measured, especially by kind of adopting some of the ideas that are kind of emanating from the global south or emanating from the third world, uh, however you'd like to describe that. Um, and before going to IU Bloomington, uh, he received his uh, PhD in history from the University of Virginia in 2013 and then went to Dartmouth, I believe. Yep. Right? Um, and so then joined the staff at Bloomington. Um, but I'd like to please uh, have you join me in welcoming Stephen Massacura to present today. Thank you so much. Well, thank you to Joe. Uh, thank all of you for coming out on a Thursday at the very end of the semester. I greatly appreciate it. I also want to thank Stephen for setting up the PowerPoint and um, the microphone that I'll try not to knock and be too awkward with this afternoon. Um, and Chris as well for handling all the logistics of this visit. So as Joe mentioned, I'm here today to present some new research from a new book project. And that book, in one sentence, is a history of the meaning and measurement of economic growth across the 20th century world. And this book uh, comes from my own reading and really the extent to which I've been inspired and somewhat enthralled by the work of scholars such as Adam Tooze, Manu Goswami, Timothy Mitchell, and others who've shown uh, how it is that the concept of economic growth, which we now think is something that is eternal and has been with us for a long time, was in fact a very recent invention of the 20th century. The way in which the concept of economic growth was premised on the creation of a calculable entity that we call the national economy. And the way in which economists and statisticians went through the process of deciding what to include and what, to, what not to include in their measurements of the economy as well. Now, central to this process is the construction of what we think of as national income and product accounts, or just more simply, figures such as gross domestic product, GDP, and gross national product, GNP. And there's a really interesting thing that's happening with GDP and GNP, which is that they're being widely critiqued. Since 2010, there have been, my, by my count, 14 English language books published by university presses that all critique GDP and argue that so many of the problems we face in society today are because of this one number. This is what I call the GDP ruined everything school. What they argue is that 
basically, uh, GDP was created by a handful of American and Northern European scholars in the 1930s and 1940s. It then took over the world. It was credited with helping to generate the great post-war boom in economic growth in the 1950s, 1960s, and 1970s. But now we enlightened moderns realize that it's flawed because it doesn't account for things like pollution, social dislocation, inequality, and so forth and so on. What struck me uh, about all of these books coming out recently is that their arguments were not all that new. Indeed, in the 1960s and 1970s, there was a similar school of thought, what I think of as the 1960s and 1970s version of the GDP ruined everything school, where books came out that argued that GDP was flawed because it didn't include all of the work and services that women provide, especially in the so-called third world. It didn't effectively account for poverty and inequality and much else. Even further back, in the period when GDP and GMP were first conceived, there was widespread criticism. And many uh, scholars pointed out the variety of flaws uh, in using those measurements as, say, a stand-in for national vitality and welfare. Uh, the great British economist Phyllis Dean pointed out why these figures uh, did not fit well with the non-marketized or monetized economies of the global south. A series of high-level UN commissions suggested that standard of living or levels of, lending, uh, levels of living were more appropriate than GDP. Even the so-called godfather of GDP, Simon Kuznets, wrote a series of articles in the 1940s explaining why GDP was such an imperfect measure that government should not rely on it at all. And so what I've decided to do in the new book project is to tell the history of the meaning and measurement of economic growth through this long history of its critics, its doubters, and its reformers, those who have long recognized the flaws in the statistic, to try to make sense of why they argued what they did and why ultimately so many of their arguments didn't stick. And today what I'll be doing is talking about a very small slice of that project, which, as Joe pointed out, was to focus on a series of environmental and ecological critiques of economic measurement and growth in the 1960s and 1970s. What I want to do in my talk today as a way just to sort of frame it and introduce some of the key ideas is to go through three major criticisms of economic growth and its measurement and one major challenge that the growth critics in this period faced. And in brief now, I'll talk more about these later. The three challenges are first, that there were simple ecological and fundamental material limits to economic growth which is probably best captured by the 1972 Limits to Growth Report by the Club of Rome. A second school of thought was that there were untallied or unaccounted for costs of economic growth. That was first put forth by a British economist named Ezra Michon. And then finally, and somewhat more obliquely, there was a school of thought that suggested that growth and the economic theories beneath it were flawed because they were fundamentally misaligned with how natural systems functioned. And that is to say, economists and policymakers fundamentally misunderstood the nature, in a quite literal sense, of the source of economic wealth. And this was first articulated and most vigorously articulated by a Romanian-American economist named Nicholas Georgescu Rogen. Now, these different criticisms of economic growth were not necessarily in tension with one another. I don't want to give that impression. I simply separate them out to highlight the different strands of critiques. I also think they're all really important for understanding the origins of the discipline of ecological economics. Most existing accounts of ecological economics tend to be very internalists and in that they just sort of follow one paper to the next and there's very little focus on the larger context in which ideas were circulating. And I also um, highlight these three strands to suggest that they all faced, and indeed all of these different individuals, were forced to reckon with a common challenge to their arguments. One, whoops, not from Keynes, uh, but from the global south, which is to say the growth critics were fiercely rebutted and challenged by many intellectuals from the so-called third world. I'm going to focus on one today, a Pakistani economist named Mahbub ul Haq who argued in various ways that to limit or to move beyond growth was fundamentally unjust, would consign much of the third world or the global south to poverty and perpetuity, and that absent an effective reconciliation 
with the long-standing legacies of colonialism and exploitation, any more environmentally sustainable alternative to growth should not be pursued. And I want to end today by suggesting that what's interesting, especially for the history of ecological economics, is that many of the growth critics took these arguments quite seriously. They wrestled with and struggled with trying to figure out how to integrate these arguments. And one of the strange things that happens over the 1970s and 1980s is that many of these ecologists and economists who critique growth in the 60s and uh, 70s become something of a moral philosopher. And they begin to speak not only of the need for, say, new models of economies, new ways to price pollution and so forth and so on, but they begin to advocate for new values, indeed a new ethos of global justice that needs to uh, frame any transition away from a growth-based society. So that's the talk in brief. Before I get to the critics, I want to provide just a little bit of background as to where economic growth comes from. So by 1960, the notion of national economic growth had swept across the world. And indeed, all countries, be they capitalist or communist, took national economic growth as their foremost, foremost purpose. Now, this stemmed from a series of innovations in economic accounting and statistics in the 1920s and 1930s. As a handful of uh, economists in Northern Europe and the United States tried to come up with ways to measure the size of a single nation's economy in an aggregate statistic. In the context of first global depression and then world war, policymakers turned to these economists looking for ways to better manage their national economies and to imagine ways they can make them grow and expand in the future. Very much central to this was the work of John Maynard Keynes and a handful of his colleagues at uh, the University of Cambridge in the 1930s. Now, by the early 1940s, in fact, by 1942, both the United States and the United Kingdom had implemented gross national product, or GNP, in their national budgeting. Both countries used GNP figures to project how much they could spend on wartime mobilization without also sending the domestic economy into recession. And by the end of the war, many capitalist countries began to adopt GNP as a basic framework for understanding national economic life. Uh, in the words of the Harvard historian Charles Mayer, by the late 1940s, almost all countries in Western Europe and the United States embraced what he called a politics of productivity, in which elites embraced national economic growth defined by aggregate produ production statistics as a way to, on the one hand, abjure sort of old distributional conflicts between capital and labor under the belief that a rising tide of national economic growth would lift all boats equally, and also as a way to try to prevent future depressions from happening again. By the 1950s, a whole generation of economists emerged that were designed, that, whose work was designed to try to figure out how to model how national economies could move through time. This is one of the graphical representations of the economist Robert Solow's famous 1956 growth model. Don't worry about explaining all the sort of individual details. Simply note that the rise of economic growth also helped to transform e economics as a discipline into a highly uh, math mathematized discipline, one that sought great parsimony and abstraction uh, as a way to try to understand not only the world, but provide usable frameworks for policymakers. There's another piece of the context here that's really important as well, which is that while the Depression and World War II created the context to make GMP first take off, it was really the Cold War and global decolonization that helped spread growth globally. At root, the competition between the two superpowers, between the United States and the Soviet Union, between capitalism and communism, was a battle over which side could produce economic growth the best. The Soviets had their own version of GNP, net material product, that by the 1940s was used in national planning in their five-year plans. And by the 1950s and 1960s, both countries became preoccupied not only with generating economic growth at home, but trying to persuade the countries of the developing world, the third world, the decolonizing world, that they offered the key to unlocking economic expansion and prosperity. And indeed, by this time, uh, many anti-colonial and revolutionary nationalist leaders began to speak the language of economic growth. Uh, 
viewing rapid national economic expansion and productivity as a necessary process to overcome the legacies of colonialism and the ongoing uh, problems they faced. Thus, as my colleague Nick Collother says, the Cold War was a race for development in many ways between the first, <laughs> second, and third worlds. And while we often think of the Cold War in terms of bombs and bullets, we should also think of it in terms of a rival between social scientists. The American uh, Walt Rittman Rostow, who spent uh, most of his career at MIT, actually with Robert Solow, in 1960 wrote the famous Stages of Economic Growth, a non-communist manifesto. And he went head to head with his Soviet counterpart, men like Radislav Ulyanovsky, who from his perch at Moscow's Institute for World Economy and International Relations, tried to conceive of Soviet models of growth for the third world over the course of the 1960s. So this all formed the kind of base context in which many environmental thinkers began to worry about the implications of this global pursuit of national economic growth. One sort of final piece of background information that I want to convey is that over the course of the 1940s and 1950s, Many environmental thinkers worried not only about the ramifications of economic growth in their home countries, say in the United States and the UK, but also about what the implication of growth all throughout the third world would be. After all, pursuing national economic growth was made possible by the widespread use of cheap fossil fuels. It often signified industrialization and urbanization, agricultural mechanization, and so forth and so on. Many really important environmentalists like Fairfield Osborne, William Vogt, Aldo Leopold, Julian Huxley wrote extensively in the 1940s and 1950s not just about their home countries, the United States and the UK, but the great fears they saw in Africa and Asia and Latin America as well as everyone pursued economic growth. Now, by the 1960s, these sorts of criticisms of the environmental consequences of economic growth really began to cohere in a number of ways. And what I'd like to do now is go through those sort of three different strands of criticism that I pointed out before. The first set is the notion that there were firm ecological limits to economic growth. This is probably best articulated and encapsulated in the work of the Stanford biologist Paul Ehrlich. On the one hand, whose work on population growth and the fear-mongering around global population growth was premised on the, faith, the, sorry, the belief that as human populations expanded into the future, they would run up against clear Malthusian limits, creating all sorts of social strife and political conflict. Ehrlich on the one hand, oops. On the other hand was the Club of Rome, which did a series of research using early uh, computing technology to imagine what would happen to all sorts of different natural resources over the long term if countries continued to pursue economic growth at the GNP rates that they were doing at the time, anywhere between 3 and 6% per annum. The Limits of Growth Report, if you haven't read it, is stocked full of a bunch of graphs that look just like this. So this is a graph of the future of arable land um, if growth rates were to continue. And what it shows is that as productivity increases, eventually the total world supply and the available uh, arable land would plummet dramatically. And so that there would be almost a major inflection point and crisis in the year 2000, as it suggests. Yeah. These two were not, uh, the, the Club of Rome and Paul Ehrlich were not the only ones at the time making these arguments. Uh, actually, one of the first articulations of this sense came from Kenneth Boulding, an uh, economist from the University of Michigan, who in 1965 uh, wrote about the growth economy as being a cowboy economy, which was uh, formed in a mistaken belief in what he called the infinite reservoirs of natural resources. Uh, we can think of, I think, Garrett Hardin's Tragedy of the Commons in a similar vein, that there were clear ecological limits to how far growing, how far growing economies could ultimately grow. So the first key set of criticisms is this notion of ecological limits to growth. The second, focused on the untallied costs of economic growth. And this became a preoccupation for a British economist named E.J. Michon, or Ezra Michon, who in the 1950s and 1960s had been something of a growth theorist in a Solovian style. But by the mid-1960s had turned against much of his previous work. And what he argued in this really important 1967 book, The Costs of Economic Growth, was that growth produced what he called 
disamenities, disamenities, which included everything from industrial pollution to resonant noise in cities to all sorts of trash and general waste, that existing economic theories and policies literally and figuratively did not account for, that there was no way to effectively calculate the costs of them, and no way for policymakers to effectively integrate their effects into policymaking. Michon's work um, spawned a range of different ways of thinking about this. One of the most important came from two American economists in 1969, uh, Robert Ayers and Alan Neese, who reframed disamenities as externalities to the economic process. In a famous 1969 article, they pointed out that sort of basic economic processes generated all sorts of unwanted things external to the economic process itself. Everything from carbon dioxide emissions to uh, pollution and waste to sewage and so forth and so on. And that they argued that this was a real problem for much of the world because the key source of information in economic systems, especially in capitalist economic systems, was prices. And these sorts of externalities were not priced in any way. And so thus they couldn't be accounted for in existing models nor effectively in policy. So the second, secret of, second key set of criticisms was this notion that there were these untallied costs of economic growth. The final set of criticisms related to the metaphors and models used to depict economic systems. Now, most growth theories, and indeed the production of statistics like GNP and GDP, rested on a particular depiction of a national economy as a closed system of monetary flows track the flow of money through a closed national territorial space. By the late 1960s and especially the early 1970s, a handful of economists began to argue that this was fundamentally flawed, not only because externalities weren't priced, but because these closed depictions of economic activity solely as a function of monetary flows totally neglected all sorts of aspects of the natural world from the use of energy to the way in which different resources move through economies and so forth and so on. And in this, the economist Nicholas Georgescu Rogen was a sort of key figure. What he argued in really kind of convoluted and plotting prose was that economic theory needed to take seriously the second law of thermodynamics, or focus particularly on entropy, as a way of trying to come up with new depictions and descriptions and models of economic activity that took better stock of the way in which energy was uh, moved through economic spaces to try to more fully account for and describe the way in which the human world and the non-human world interacted. His research spawned all sorts of really weird and somewhat um, strange, frankly, ways to try to depict uh, economies that took stock of uh, environmental and ecological processes. Uh, the ecologist Howard Odom published a book in 1971 called Energy, Power, and Society that attempted to link economic activity with energy flows in the visual language of uh, electronic circuits. And so these are Odom's different models of a wide range of different economies. The top left is an advanced industrial economy. Again, don't worry about sort of figuring out the specifics and how this functions. Just note that they're kind of strange and sort of efforts at groping towards new ways of depicting this. Uh, probably the most famous and what became the most important was uh, the work of Herman Daly, who was one of Georgescu Rogan's students, who argued that national economies needed to be understood not in terms of flows, but stocks of wealth. And what Daly argued in particular was a depiction of what he called the steady state economy that focused on the flow of energy through matter um, and waste in a given economy uh, to measure the total stock of wealth and the extent to which activity by humans increased or decreased that stock at a given rate. So this formed the kind of third key set of criticisms about economic growth and its measurement. Now, these criticisms led to all sorts of different prescriptions about what to do with the growth state and the focus on economic growth. Uh, Paul Ehrlich very famously argued for really aggressive population control measures. 
a fellow traveler, uh, an American economist named Stephen Enke, was hired by the US Agency for International Development to go to different third world countries and calculate what he called averted birth, which is how much money could be added to a country's gross domestic product for every child not born to make the case that limiting population would actually increase GDP over the long run. Uh, Nice and Ayers argued for different ways to actually try to price externalities, which spawned a wide set of articles and books and academic discussions about a way to sort of put an actual value on ecosystems and pollution and so forth and so on in monetary terms. And Daly and Georgescu Rogan thought through all the different types of regulations and laws that would need to be put in place to help bring about the steady state. Before I move on to the sort of big challenge that they faced from the global south, I want to just mention that while in retrospect these can seem somewhat zany and unusual, for a while in the 1970s they had real popular purchase, especially in the United States and Western Europe. When the oil crisis hit in 1973, and many Americans had the experience of waiting in long gas lines, I think in, to a great extent it helped Americans in an everyday sense imagine a world in which economic growth had firm ecological limits. Paul Ehrlich was one of the most popular speakers going across the country in the early 1970s. There was a widespread media coverage in the US, Western Europe, and Japan about the 1972 Limits to Growth Report. Even before the oil crisis, the American Academy on Arts and, Science, uh, Arts and Sciences hosted a major week-long conference, bringing in all sorts of experts to imagine what a no-growth society would look like. The American oil tycoon, George Mitchell, sponsored a $100,000 prize in 1974 to see who could come up with the best idea to generate a steady state economy in the United States. In 1974, the UN hosted a major conference on population growth, which led US uh, Secretary of State Henry Kissinger to draft this long confidential memorandum about how population growth over the long term imperiled US national security. By the late 1970s, uh, the World Bank, under the leadership of the American Robert McNamara, formally renounced national economic growth as the ultimate purpose of World Bank lending policy, instead saying that they would focus on things such as satisfying basic human needs and eradicating poverty around the world. And so all that is to say, for a time at least in the early and mid-1970s, the arguments of the growth critics seemed to resonate more widely, at least in American and European society. Now, despite all of their arguments and all of their enthusiasm for them, <laughs> in many ways, in part because of that, their efforts to, to displace the growth paradigm encountered a wide range of challenges. Many of these emanated from the global south. Indeed, a common set of arguments against the growth critics suggested that to try to end or move beyond economic growth would simply reinforce Western economic dominance over the global south. After all, this period in the early 1970s when the growth critics were making their arguments coincided with the same period in which the third world as a political project in Vijay Prashad's terms really came to a head. Indeed, third world intellectuals and leaders were challenging the existing global economic order, arguing that they had a fundamental right to development that needed to be enshrined in international law, and indeed, which led them to try to rewrite the fundamental laws, rules, and regulations of the global economy, which came to a head in the famous declaration of the new international economic order in April 1974. This is the Algerian leader, Houari Boumediene, announcing the NIEO. And indeed, the NIEO suggested that the bedrock problem of international politics was not a shared embrace of national economic growth or industrial modernity unequal world that was defined by colonialism and its legacies and frequent invasions of national sovereignty. Environmental protection was a rich man's game. It was neo-imperial, another way in which wealthy elites from the first world could invade or at least curtail the sovereignty of third world countries. And this moving beyond growth was something that was a luxury that could only happen once basic needs had been met. 
Now, these arguments against the growth critics played out in a wide range of venues in the early 1970s, in academic journals, in think tanks, and a series of conferences. But they really came to a head in the 1972 UN Conference on the Human Environment in Stockholm, which is really the first big UN conference on the environment. I wrote about this a bit in my first book. But one of the interesting things about the lead up to the 1972 Stockholm Conference was just how fervently representatives from the so-called third world countries critiqued the growth critics. Many key national delegations, but especially the Brazilian and Indian delegations. Here's uh, Indira Gandhi meeting with the head of the UN conference, Marie Strong, really argued that any efforts by those trying to curtail or change economic growth in some way needed to be met with strong collective action on the part of the global south. And that if there were any attempts to curtail their ability to pursue growth as they saw fit, that the first world needed to respond with huge increases in additional foreign aid and all sorts of mechanisms for financial compensation for lost revenue. Now, as these were coming to a fever pitch in the lead up to the conference in the spring of 1972, the Limits to Growth Report was released. And the Limits to Growth Report then became kind of a focal point for third world critiques of the anti-growth arguments. And there were many criticisms of the Limits to Growth Report. But I want to just highlight one by the Pakistani economist Mahbub ul haq who by early 1972 had moved to the World Bank where he was serving as the chief economist, basically the equivalent of director of policy planning in the organization. And in a series of first talks at the World Bank, and then in a series of articles, Hawk really thoroughly critiqued the Limits to Growth Report. He critiqued it on technical grounds, but also I think it's important to note on moral grounds. I want to quote from one of the things he wrote about the, world, uh, the Limits to Growth Report. What he argued is that the basic weakness, and I quote, is not that it is alarmist, but that is, it is complacent the industrialized countries may be able to accept a target of zero growth as a disagreeable, yet perhaps morally bracing regime for their own citizens. But for the developing world, however, zero growth offers only a prospect of despair, and world income redistribution is left merely a wistful dream." End quote. And so for Hawk, anti-growth arguments that didn't take stock of, say, the criticisms that would soon be levied in the NIEO, and the larger concerns of the Global South, was fundamentally unjust. What's interesting to note is that Hawk himself became a really strong critic of growth as a focus of national policy. He argued that the faith in GDP growth as a kind of trickle-down effect would not ultimately resolve poverty. He used his own experiences in Pakistan as a planner as evidence of this. But he argued that the moving beyond the pursuit of national economic growth as a policy goal worldwide would ultimately fail to address the existing unequal distribution of wealth and power in the international system. And indeed, at worst, might even create cover for further deepening and exacerbating of those inequalities. Now, the growth critics took seriously these arguments. But initially, in the early 1970s, they really struggled to respond to them and to make sense of them. And there's all sorts of different sort of debates they had internally. I just want to mention a couple really quickly. Uh, one pertained to the issue of democracy, which is to say, many growth critics acknowledged that the quickest way to say a steady state or a zero growth society was through profoundly anti-democratic means. Kenneth Boulding wrote, and I quote, that it could well be, for instance, that the easiest way to achieve a steady state would be to set up an unshakable tyranny with a very small world ruling class which would be able to keep the vast mass of mankind in steady state poverty. This was a common theme in the early 1970s. Indeed, no less a figure than George Kennan, the famous American statesman, wrote a major article on foreign affairs in 1970 arguing just that, that there needed to be an elite group of technocrats from the West who would manage and keep track of all of the world's waste, uh, resources to, in his words, prevent a world wasteland. But this was profoundly anti-democratic. And many of the growth critics realized that this sat 
uneasily with the sort of third worldist argument that was not only about economic justice, but political empowerment as well. Another sort of related issue argued that to move beyond a growth oriented world would also, it's just, sorry, to do that in a just way, would require widespread redistribution of resources. And indeed, to sort of take Hawke's arguments to its logical conclusion, moving beyond growth would require a massive wealth transfer from the wealthy countries of the global north to the global south. Many acknowledged that this was something for which there was very little political will in the context of the first world in the early 1970s. And they really struggled to imagine any kind of effective policy mechanisms to do that. And so, what happens when you read these documents, read their letters, their conversations amongst themselves, the growth critics, is that sort of aware of all of these problems and really struggling for any clear policy solutions, they began to turn to ethics and to morality. And by the early 1980s, Georgescu Rogan, Ezra Mishan, Kenneth Boulding, Herman Daly, all began to write extensively about values to imagine different ways of pursuing justice. Kenneth Boulding, in his sort of economist way, talked about the need to find more justice researchers all around the world to help them make sense of the complex ethical problems so that they adhered in these debates over growth. One of the interesting things that happens over the 1980s is that many of these growth critics try to infuse a lot of their ecological arguments with a newfound commitment to global economic justice. And we can see this in a lot of different ways. But I just want to focus for a few minutes on Herman Daly's work in the 1980s. Daly became a key figure in setting up ecological economics as a special branch of study. He co-founded the first journal with that name. He co-founded the first professional society with that name. And fundamental to sort of all of the early documentation on the Society of Ecological Economics and so forth and so on, were all sorts of long tracks about morality. Daly wrote again and again about the need of wealthy countries uh, and citizens within them to turn away from what he called excess materialism, to pursue a new spiritualism that would sacrifice material growth in the name of global redistribution. And that only once these sort of new values and people found new ways of imagining their role in the world and their sense of obligation to one another, could they begin to imagine different ways of moving beyond growth? And over the 1980s, as part of this process, uh, Daly actually teamed up with an American theologian named John Cobb Jr. to try to construct an alternative to GNP, what he called the Genuine Progress Indicator, or the GPI. What's interesting about this is, one, how many different elements it includes, uh, but two, the extent to which, at least in its early iterations, the Genuine Progress Indicator took stock of all sorts of different third world critiques. And so alongside issues of, say, consumption patterns and ozone depletion and non-renewable resource depletion that would have been common in the early 60s and 70s, Daly really took seriously arguments from third worldists, arguing for, say, ways to try to calculate unwaged domestic labor. Um, which was a major critique of third worldists who argued that so much of putative economic activity in their countries took place outside the realm of the market or money transactions and it was, was thus unaccounted for. There's all sorts of efforts to try to calculate not only unemployment but underemployment to come up with concepts that reflected the way in which work took place in many third world countries. And indeed, to try to sort of make this uh, genuine progress indicator into something practical, Daly took up a job in the World Bank in the 1980s, where he wrote extensively on how countries might adopt the GPI in policy planning. But also, if you go and look through all of his papers that he wrote in the World Bank, he did a lot of sort of moral philosophizing to different countries around the world, and worked really heavily uh, trying to convince representatives from the wealthy countries in the World Bank to make the case to their societies at home about the need to adopt new sets of values, and so forth and so on. I could go on and on about this, um, but I think I'll start to wrap up now. And to wrap up, I want to sort of reflect in two different ways, one that's historical and one that is historiographical, sort of how we tell our stories about this past.
The first argument um, that I want to make on the historical front is that the arguments from the growth critics had both great power and really clear limits in the 1970s. Pardon me. They were powerful because they resonated with really obvious signs of growth's downsides and its limits, as I mentioned before. Not only the oil crisis, but the wide range of environmental disasters that took, across, took place in the first world in the 1970s, the robust environmental movement, and so forth and so on, that helped make the notions of resource scarcity and limits to growth meaningful in everyday life. And yet this context really limited their appeal. Indeed, by 1978, when American social scientists noted that the growth critics had fallen from public view in favor of much more optimistic pronouncements about growth's future, about the possibility of technical and technological solutions to limits to growth. Indeed, by the early 1980s, fears of scarcity gave way once again to renewed visions of abundance in the West. Of course, there was also a decline in the East, global debt crisis for much of the global South. But at least in the first world, growth was recast in market-friendly terms, but celebrated anew. Though the growth critics persisted in their work, and people like Daly kept on doing, the context which had provided them such public profiles, uh, in many ways kind of cultural sustenance in the 1970s, faded. And without that context anymore, their arguments began to fell increasingly on deaf ears as policymakers around the world doubled down on growth once again. As Henry Kissinger put the matter quite bluntly at the OECD's annual meeting in 1975, and I quote, stagnation magnifies all of our difficulties. There's no way around it. Stable growth enhances all our possibilities, end quote. And so by the early 1980s, once again, growth was revived, serving many of the same political purposes as it once did, displacing concerns over inequality and distributional conflicts under the promise of future growth as evidence of the material and symbolic power of a country's economic system in a way to provide citizens with faith in the future as a way to look beyond any struggles in the present day. And so that's sort of the historical uh, reflection. The historiographical one is this, which is that all of the books that I mentioned at the very start of my talk, I think overlook the extent to which growth has long been criticized and challenged from many quarters. Indeed, the really fraught efforts to challenge and try to replace the growth paradigm in the 1970s I think really reveal some important insights into how we tell the story of growth in the 20th century world. Our narratives of post-war growth tend to celebrate the rise of GMP and growth uh, and growth planning as a form of uh, sort of as evidence of the political triumph of economic expertise. One of the major themes of all of these books is that economists are treated as omniscient as excessively confident in their aspirations, and ultimately, it's relatively consensual, and that they all got along and worked together. But the story of the growth critics suggests something different. Often how difficult it was to define and manage the numbers that made growth meaningful, how experts frequently argued with and challenged one another, not only on what they counted and why, but also the relationship between their techniques and politics more broadly. And also how setting up states to pursue growth and imagine better futures required deep and often unsuccessful reconciliation with various historical legacies. And I think, too, for the historian, studying these debates over numbers is not just some arcane activity. This is something I have to tell myself all the time these days. I think it actually provides a really interesting vantage point uh, to view different conflicts over values and how those conflicts over values shape state building and policy making more broadly. After all, how a country, or imagine any level of governance, uh, measures itself and measures its development goes a long way to shaping how they'll pursue that development. In many ways, official measurements reflect what leaders value in society. And thus, analyzing how those come to be, how they're challenged, and in some cases those challenges are defeated, 
can help reveal all sorts of cultural sensibilities and ideological assumptions that help shape and sustain these numbers in the first place. Throughout the 20th century, it was indeed true that GNP growth formed the central purpose of national governments, encapsulating the hopes and dreams and in some cases fears of policymakers who really looked to the promise of future abundance as a way to overcome conflicts of the past and present. And yet alongside them sat the growth critics, the many other experts and activists who argued for alternative measures, not only Daly's genuine progress indicator, uh, but things like Mahbub ul Haq's own human development index that tried to express a different definition of what it meant for a country to be developed, how policymakers and indeed lay citizens should define national purpose, how they should measure their success, how they should be assessed in this process, and ultimately, how societies should express and define their core values. And so to wrap all this up, I'll simply say, that I think the history of the meaning and measurement of economic growth and the history of development should be understood less as one of consensus and indeed triumph, but rather one of ongoing contestation. And thus, the growth critics of the 1960s and 70s that I talked about, much less the growth critics of the present day, are not aberrations in some longer triumphal story of GNP's rise, but are rather a fundamental component of a longer history of growth from its inception to the present day. And so I'll stop there and look forward to trying to answer any questions you guys may have. Thank you. Uh, to some extent, um, I actually think there's um, a little bit of overlap and a little bit of conflict between the human rights um, sort of movement at the time and a lot of the environmental critics um, of growth. Part of it is the extent to which the human rights in the 1970s becomes a kind of individualistic view that focuses on um, the protection of individual civil and political rights. Um, and by the 1970s, especially in the 1980s, the GPI is focused much more on a kind of aggregate and sort of collective sense as well. And as I sort of pointed out, it's very much focused on uh, all sorts of social and economic rights and sort of issues as well. Um, one of the interesting things, pardon me, that comes through, um, if you read into the sort of papers of Balding and Daly and Georgescu Rogan and so forth and so on, is actually how infrequently the phrase human rights comes up at all. Um, it was happening at the same time and I was you know, expecting that there would be sort of some overlap as well. There's actually very little discussion of human rights as well. And I suspect that this might have something to do with it as well. That's a good question. Yeah. 1995, Yeah. Yeah, so there's a really kind of interesting backstory to this, which is that um, there was a big debate in the United States um, in the first year of the Clinton administration about whether to try to incorporate some of the ecological insights from ecological uh, um, uh, economists formally into U.S. national accounts, right? The, the data that the Commerce Department's Bureau of Economic Analysis puts forth that does all the GDP and GMP updates and so forth and so on. There's actually this major commission of economists um, that were tasked with coming up and sort of settling on the ways in which to measure sort of environmental uh, decline and so forth and so on, whether to integrate them and so forth and so on. Uh, one of Daly's colleagues, who was also very active in the Ecological Economic Society at this time, Robert Costanzo, took a leading role in this. Um, and initially, it seemed like this sort of expert panel was going to argue, ultimately, that these should be incorporated kind of front and center. So that you start, when you look at the US's formal GDP uh, calculations and so forth and so on, there's all sorts of statistics on environmental as well. For reasons I can't quite figure out yet, um, ultimately, the panel decided at the last minute to say no to that, and instead to create what we now call the supplemental accounts. 
And so the U.S. government actually does track ecological decline and prices ecosystem services and so forth and so on. But it's on like the eighth click as you go through the BEA webpage. Um, and so the 1995 uh, Atlantic article came right as the sort of panel was making these decisions about whether or not to argue that this should be sort of front and central to how the U.S. calculates its economy um, and ultimately, you know, whether or not it should be included in a formal sense or a supplemental sense. You know, to speculate as to why that would happen, I think we can imagine, you know, the different reasons why the administration would not want to, you know, have to revise the GDP accounts to make them look far worse than they might otherwise look. The economy happened to be doing really well, and GDP was very high in that particular time and so forth and so on. But you're right. I mean, it seemed like that was a particular moment when this might have sort of broken through um, nationally and sort of more entered into mainstream consciousness, but also into formal policymaking. Um, but if you have any suggestions as to why you think that might be, I'd love to hear them. Right. Yeah, so one of these books that I pointed out here, this Mismeasuring Our Lives, um, uh, was a report, began as a report commissioned by the French government under Nicolas Sarkozy, yeah, to sort of integrate all sorts of new measures uh, as the benchmarks and kind of indicators of overall French well-being. Um, it did not ultimately replace GDP or GMP in French national accounts. Um, it became sort of a somewhat popular academic text. It was written by a crow written by a handful, a, a trio of sort of superstar economists. Um, but many countries now do still produce these parallel accounts. The Scandinavians do, a number of Western European countries do, a number of countries in the global south do, a few of the small island nations have special climactic accounts that sort of trace the effects of rising sea levels and so forth and so on and project forward. The UN actually has a really robust system of economic statistics, oh, sorry, environmental statistics as well as part of its overall system of national accounts as well. And so these are all sort of still going on, but as far as I can tell, they're sort of still subsidiary um, or kind of tertiary, tertiary elements of national policy. Um, they're useful for researchers who are doing work in this area, and this is still a vibrant area of research, but they haven't still sort of broken through, at least uh, in terms of national policy making or kind of public consciousness. But maybe, you know, if we get dozens more of these books in the next few years, that'll sort of help push that cause in that way. Uh, yeah, in the back row. I saw your hand first. This is great. Thank you. Um, you talked about the, from the 60s to the 80s, this was very much an international dialogue, I guess mostly mediated through the World Bank, these policy institutions where the Global South and the West are coming together. What about today, this current crop of critics, are they building off of people like Amartya Sen, or to what extent do we have a global dialogue now, or do we have different camps not talking? Um, yeah, so Marty Sen is actually one of the co-authors of the mismeasuring uh, report for France. Yeah, so that's an interesting question. So there was this kind of really robust transnational civil society, though I think it's worth mentioning that it was a very elite network, right? Um, and many of the kind of third worldist intellectuals were ones that were educated at Western universities and so forth and so on, and so they sort of moved through similar social circles and so forth and so on. You know, by all accounts, this is still very much ongoing. I was doing... Um, some research at the World Wildlife Fund uh, in the uh, U.S. headquarters in Washington, D.C., which is this palatial building right near the State Department. Um, and the, I was there, and I actually sat in on a meeting on ecosystem services pricing. And they had, as many of these NGOs do now, this kind of like diverse array of voices from all different parts of the world sort of explaining, you know, why or why not this might be useful. Um, and so I think there's st still a great quantity of these relations. I'm not entirely sure nor convinced of the quality of them. They seem to be sort of going on and on, but it does, in many ways, sort of like the 1960s and 1970s, seem to be a sort of collective of sort of elite individuals moving through networks that, um, you know, interestingly seem to have less influence in national policy and national governments than they do in a handful of select international institutions. And so insofar as there's been sort of meaningful policy work, 
um, and sort of policy implementation of these ideas, they've tended to be in international institutions, not just the World Bank, but the UN, and even ones like the OECD. Yes, Yeah, so um, in brief, where am I? I'm going to here. Um, so environmental economics, as I understand it, and as was discussed at the time, was a kind of older branch of what used to be called resource economics, about managing different resources and so forth and so on. And indeed, many of the sort of early uh, thinkers about disamenities and externalities came out of that background. Uh, Nice and Ayres both worked for uh, this sort of quasi-governmental think tank in D.C. called Resources for the Future in the 1960s, which is where they began to do their research along these lines. Ecological economics um, evolved and was sort of defined later, um, largely out of the work of uh, Daly and uh, Robert Costanza that wasn't just about focusing on resources and stocks, but the way that I sort of think of it and describe it as well as a kind of much more holistic and kind of interdisciplinary approach to understanding economic phenomena that tried to more effectively link and describe natural systems and economic systems in a kind of coherent, singular language. What's also interesting as well is the extent to which, at least early on, so much of the kind of official documentation and rhetoric was also infused with this notion of global economic justice as well, which is to say it was not just a way of studying the world in a dispassionate um, discipline, but was infused with a kind of political and moral purpose as well. Does that sort of get at your question? Yeah, and so one of the, um, this is, you know, a sort of big debate to this day. And one of the, this, I think one area where we see this sort of front and center in academic debate, and at least for a time a few years ago in policy debate, was this notion of a so-called carbon tax, and as a way to sort of try to price carbon. The Obama administration actually came up with what they call the social cost of carbon emissions as a way to assess um, new development projects, to try to calculate and price what the effects of um, the release of greenhouse gases would be over a long period of time into the atmosphere, regardless of just what the sort of economic value of new things would. And of course, many economists, indeed, I would say the majority of economists, argue for a carbon tax, and that the, they would say the best way to pursue any kind of sustainable future um, is not through any kind of aggressive regulatory structure, but instead to provide price signals um, to markets more broadly. And so that not only the you know, wastewater treatment and so forth and so on, it's sort of priced in all sorts of invisible and convoluted ways, but that all sorts of aspects of the environmental consequences of our economic activity would be legible to markets. And thus sort of consumers acting rationally would sort of make decisions accordingly and that states would gradually then begin to move away from carbon intensive forms of development and energy use and so forth and so on. And so that's what they say. I'm a little less convinced, but my arguments are not um, as fully formed as theirs. But that's certainly one of the big arguments right now. One of the first things the Trump administration actually did was to eliminate the social cost of carbon accounting from the US as well. Um, it was, a, in fact, really remarkable. It was just within a few days after the inauguration that it, the, the Commerce Department announced that they were going to stop calculating the social cost of carbon. They, firstly, they initially sort of ran it down to a very low figure, and they were like, basically, we're not going to deal with this anymore. Oh, congratulations. Yeah. 
silence and then someone said, well, elections have consequences. So uh, this is going to be an interesting one. But I'm increasingly convinced that this, this GPI is still relevant in the sense that we are counting cleanup, increasingly cleanup of messes from water pollution, from climate change, yeah. And when you talk about trying to clean these things up, you're, you're, you're challenged that you're taking away from real economic activity. Right. Now, the evidence is pretty clear that prevention is more cost effective in almost all cases than cleanup. So I think there's some very important issues here at state. Whether we'll be able to do anything about it on this council. Well, I thank you for your service. I don't envy the task in front of you, but I really appreciate you coming and sharing that as well. And to sort of touch on the last point with something you said, um, what I think is worth stressing as well, which especially becomes important by the 1990s, is this notion of risk, right? And a big argument for pricing emissions is that it's a way to manage future risk. Um, and the idea being that we now know by the 1990s, indeed many would say by the 1960s, that there are all sorts of long-term impediments to sort of future prosperity, um, all sorts of unexpected risks inherent in the growth process as well. And that by adopting a way of measuring and accounting for that activity that at least priced in that risk um, early on would sort of provide this really sort of core preventative power that would help alleviate these situations before they even really uh, get going. So I've started trying to do some back of the envelope calculations. Oh, yeah? On how much these costs just from climate change are going to be the thing that costs. Huh. So that's something that most people understand. Right. Less theoretical. And the no I, I'm partly in the process of the numbers that are very large. Sure. Right. And then you obviously have to clean them up, you know, and spend money on them. And you lose the whole calculus of economics and the importance of more cost effective incremental moves. So, um, as I say, there's a lot at stake right now. Yeah, that's a, again, thank you. And one of your sort of comment now just made me think, one of the sort of interesting issues that many of these folks wrestled with in the 70s and 80s was not just to account for all the very specific material consequences you just mentioned, but the somewhat more um, immaterial and in many ways ineffable aspects of the enjoyment of seeing a stream look a particular way, right? Seeing an unspoiled landscape and so forth and so on. I think one of the interesting things about the GPI, which is in many ways a kind of harkening back to the 1960s, is the extent to which noise was a preoccupation of so many of these growth critics in the 1960s. The UN actually did a lot of work in the late 1960s to organize around international noise control. And this is the time when a few cities like Portland, Oregon began to develop sort of really robust noise ordinances and so forth and so on. And trying to find ways to sort of measure and count for the ways in which sort of simply hearing vague industrial hums like this might um, impair or curtail our enjoyment of the world around us in ways we may not even be fully conscious of and so forth and so on. And that remains, I think, a really perplexing but also kind of profound issue um, for trying to replace sort of old numbers with new sets of numbers as well. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so the bulk of the second part of the book is about those indicators and a wide range of others. And it sort of traces, because they, they in many ways sort of interact and uh, relate to one another in different ways. Uh, it's Mahbubul Haq who actually comes up with the Human Development Index over the course of the 1980s, and he actually wrestles with trying to find ways to incorporate ecological uh, considerations into the HDI. It's ultimately left out in favor of life expectancy and so forth and so on. 
Um, the Millennium Development Goals and later the Sustainable Development Goals are in many ways a kind of hodgepodge of these different ways of trying to measure society in alternative ways. I talk a lot about, or will write a lot about, I should say, um, the early efforts to measure uh, and quantify happiness and satisfaction that emerged in the 1970s and 1980s. Uh, there's a wide range of international institutions and many um, governments in the global south that try to calculate new categories of work because they argue for various reasons that um, employment versus unemployment is not an effective set of categories. I write about the uh, quote unquote discovery of the informal sector um, and the different types of works that go sort of beyond formal accounts and so forth and so on. And sort of getting back to the question of networks, what's interesting is that all of these sort of people um, uh, interact with one another in all sorts of common institutions. The World Bank in the 70s is one site. There's this um, really heterodox uh, development think tank attached to the University of Sussex in the UK called the Institute for Development Studies, um, where Amartya Sen and many other sort of key um, reform-minded economists spend time in the 70s and 80s that produces a lot of this research. Um, over the course of the 1980s, the UN Development Program becomes a really important venue for these sorts of conversations as well. And so I think they're all sort of part of a project of rethinking growth, right, and trying to find other ways to measure a uh, society that point to other values. In the Human Development Index, it's how long you live your life and some consideration of distributional questions within a society. The GPI is very holistic, tries to encapsulate all of these things. Um, and in many ways, they reflect individuals working with one another, at times against one another, um, and making sort of different decisions about what ultimately to value. And so all that is to say, in a kind of long-winded way, that yes, there's, I think, a lot of um, sort of shared connections, and that they're all, I think, part of a similar intellectual project, or at least that's part of what I'm arguing. <laughs> yeah, it's a really interesting question. And there's actually a lot of conflict with sort of in different organizations. One sort of big environmental group is called Friends of the Earth, which has all sorts of branches. And in the 70s, Friends of the Earth goes through this kind of identity crisis where it's split between those who want to do sort of direct action. Some become sort of very radical environmentalists, the Earth Firster types. Um, others become far more um, institutionalized, much more like the World Wildlife Fund. There's actually a big debate um, in the U.S. branch of Friends of the Earth about the amount of money that they started to spend on trying to come up with alternatives to GDP. And for many of the more radical members, they argue that this was a kind of a silly technocratic shell game where you're just trying to replace one aggregate single number with another. And in both cases, you just entrench expert-led technocracy um, that's uh, anti-democratic and um, instills the wrong values regardless of how much the designers of these sorts of indicators sort of wrestle with arguments about justice and so forth and so on. Um, and I think a, at least a few of them uh, leave the organization and go to join the direct action ones and that argue that you know, this kind of very abstract policy-oriented work um, is not sufficient given the depth and urgency of the ecological crisis and only things that like direct physical action where your body's on the line can be meaningful in that context. Yeah. And I've been trying to figure out how to articulate this, but one of the things you were talking about, and one of the things you got mentioned the, the question and answer, is that this kind of got some play, especially in these kind of supranational organizations and kind of bigger than the state organizations. Yeah. 
Yeah, so that's, that's an interesting question. I need to think a little bit more about it. Yeah, the GPI is actually cre not created until the 1980s, and so it's a little bit after that. There's actually sort of, um, Daly starts really working on it in the early 1980s, um, and then when he sort of finally finishes it and is ready to deploy it, um, it's 1983 and 1984, and much of the global south is sort of wrecked by the debt crisis. And sort of surprise, surprise, it shows the same thing that most conventional economic indicators do, which is that things are going quite poorly um, for much of the world. Um, that doesn't directly answer your question, um, but I do think there is a larger sense that, and maybe this has something to do, that the, the pursuit of national economic growth um, that sort of came at um, the four conjunctures that I described uh, earlier, sort of global depression, then world war, then cold war, and decolonization, really all sort of linking together in the 1940s, um, was also a period in which the international economy was structured so as to give tremendous autonomy to the wealthy industrialized countries, right? This is the era of when the Bretton Woods system is super thick, right? Especially 44 to say 57, 58, when countries start to uh, leave the, the currency suspension issues as well. And so in some sense, national economic growth takes off in a moment that is in which so much of uh, the rules of the international economy and so much national focus is on rapid national economic growth, recovery from the war, and so forth and so on. Then sort of as that begins to fade away, as you get into the 1960s, um, you know, not only is decolonization, you know, taking all of these really interesting forms, pan-Arabism, pan-Africanism, third worldism more broadly as well, um, there is all of these sort of other movements who begin to see sort of connections across borders, common shared plight, right, where national, you know, one of the interesting things from the, I always find interesting about the sort of environmental thinkers is how sort of roundly and equally they critique both the capitalist and communist world. And that by the 1960s, they've sort of anticipated convergence theory. This idea that, you know, as capitalist and communist societies sort of age, they end up looking a lot alike. Well, people like Julian Huxley are arguing by 1945 that uh, in environmental terms, it's almost indistinguishable <laughs> whether a country is capitalist or communist because they both build giant polluting factories, they both build large hydroelectric dams and so forth and so on. Um, and so I wonder if the 1960s sort of helps give a kind of wider purchase to that way of thinking as well and sort of makes these sorts of collective projects more possible. Now I'm really just rambling and sort of moving away, but we're thinking together at the end of a Thursday, at the end of the semester. Um, is it too pessimistic to say that after 75 years or so of thinking about this issue, GDP took hold at the beginning of that and has really never left that, that despite efforts by distributionists and environmentalists and other people, somehow we can't get either economists or governments to let go of GDP. Is, is that true? And if so, why? <laughs> well, so that's the argument of all of these new books um, that sort of suggest in a kind of, oh, no. oh well. Uh, you sort of get the idea that, um, you know, GDP is flawed in all of these different ways. Um, you know, one of the major arguments a lot of these books now is that it doesn't account for the digital economy and all the transactions that happen at late speed. What I'm, what I'm <laughs> thinking is, I have seen an awful lot of these criticisms from various quarters. Right. But in the end, the economists still maintain that GDP is the better measure for whatever reasons they come up with, main economists, and core economists, and governments go along with that. I mean, if we look now at the, at the debate in the last American presidential election, or if we look right. at the comparisons between China and India and so forth, the focus is GDP. Well, and so maybe the the um, uh, practitioner in the room can speak to this as well. We used to teach together. Right. Right. Then you can address in part the concerns of the people that are worried about distribution. So these are related. 
And I will say, too, as a historian, you know, I think one of the takeaways that's emerging from this research, um, and I'm sort of inclined to be very pessimistic about this, but I always try not to be uh, too pessimistic, is that there are sort of certain contexts and conditions that sort of make these sorts of arguments resonate more or less, right? And that part of the argument was that the early 1970s, there was a wide range of contingent events that sort of made the growth critics' arguments resonate. You know, it's no coincidence, I think, and I think we can do a little bit of historical analysis to why all these books are coming out now, right? They all came after the 2008 financial crisis. They all came out, uh, came out after the sort of rise of the new inequality studies in the way in which economists like Piketty and many others um, are sort of calculating all sorts of different aspects that haven't been included in the country. We've talked a lot about the environmental stuff. But, you know, all the extent to which um, money is routed through tax havens and offshore and so forth, uh, offshore um, spaces. We're also in a moment where um, climate change is not necessarily just understood as it was in the 1980s and 1990s as something that will happen in the future that we need to prevent. I think many more are willing to accept that it's happening now, right, and that it's part and parcel of the way in which we live now. And I think together, those all sort of frame not only the academic context where people sort of take these things seriously, and I could probably read myself uh, into that narrative as well, but um, would perhaps open up the political space for these conversations. I think the fact that so many economists are discussing this um, and the extent to which, you know, even things like the social cost of carbon um, for a few years uh, in the 2010s indicate that there's, you know, once again an opportunity. The, the challenge is um, finding ways to make it stick, right, and make it durable. And in that sense, the sort of mind-bogglingly dangerous and terrible aspects of climate change, um, uh, horrible though they are, may in fact be the bright spot in this regard, right, in creating the visible signs and set of experiences that provide a kind of political opening for this sort of reform. That's my best try at being something resembling optimistic. <laughs> Of course. So are there people who are, yeah, so this is actually um, quite, well, I don't want to say quite popular, but there's a growing number of um, scholars and activists in continental Europe especially um, that focus on what they call degrowth, which is not only no growth, um, but sort of imagining ways to sort of roll back different aspects of it. In French, it's called décroissance. And there's a wide range, there's a whole sort of network of degrowth scholars and activists. If you're interested in this, um, an old ecological economist named Juan Martinez Allier has written extensively about degrowth and its different elements and so forth and so on, which is a way of sort of imagining the policies, the politics, but also the sort of the cultural elements that would uh, lead to um, uh, no, uh, not even a no growth, but a kind of degrowth society. There's also been, you know, um, a, a sort of range of concerns with what economists call secular stagnation, um, or what seem to be like permanent low growth societies. One of the authors of one of these books um, is a history PhD turned um, very wealthy investor named Zachary Carabell, who wrote a long article in Foreign Affairs a few years ago about um, Japan, in many ways, resembling a kind of no growth or at least a permanently low growth society and why that's actually not a problem and why Japan might actually be positioned to uh, prosper and thrive in uh, all sorts of different ways um, in these sorts of scenarios. And so the Carabelle essay might be a, a, a way to think about that as well. Thank you all.